Hello, I'm Fanolo O'Carroll, I'm an archaeologist, and we're here in Trim today, and I'm going to take you on a walk to discover the hidden history of the Porchfields and Newtown Trim. So for the purposes of this walk, we're going to assume that you're going to start at the Sheep Gate in Trim. Sheep Gate is the last surviving gate through the town walls of Trim Town itself. And above us is the yellow steeple, the bell tower of the Abbey of St Mary's, the Augustinian Abbey. When we go out through the Sheep Gate, the town wall, or what's left of it, is stretching away up to our left and we can see up high above us the yellow steeple. So we're out into the porch fields and we're going to walk through the porch fields all the way across to Newtown Trim. But what were the porch fields? Well, we know that in about 1194, Walter de Lacey granted rights of pasture to the Burgesses of Trim, the property holders in the town, on his fallow lands and he also granted them three acres each for cultivation. Now, probably not in the same place, but certainly the porch fields would have formed part of the land parcels that were used. So we know that from the earliest time of the medieval settlement, the porch fields were used by the people of the town to supplement their own uh, food source, really. But we hear that by 1449, Richard, Duke of York, who was then Governor of Trim, granted the porch fields to the Abbey of St Mary's. And it's the first time that that name, Porchfield, is recorded. Now, the locals would not recognise porch fields. They say porchy fields, which is probably more accurate because it might have come from the French word port, as in uh, door or gate, or perhaps from the English word perch, which is a measure, a unit of measure. And it actually is 16 and a half feet wide, very awkward unit, um, and may refer to the width of the ridges of plough lands. So in the past, if you were ploughing land, you used a team of oxen and they would go up and down creating furrows and creating big ridges between the furrows. And the, the total width from furrow over the ridge to the furrow might have been as much as 16 and a half uh, feet. And the length that oxen could pull the plough without break was 220 yards or one furlong. Dermot Kelly, a native of Trim, has done a study of the porch fields and he's been able to show that a lot of the ridges and furrows that can be seen measure about the 220 yards in length and about that width. So he's suggesting that the name may have been to do with this ancient system of ploughlands. Dermot has also written about the road that runs from the Sheep Gate through the porch fields to Newtown Trim. And that road itself is mentioned in a grant dating to 1476. So the road can be traced as a linear hollow, but as we walk from the Sheep Gate, we've got a hedgerow on our right hand side and then we can see down to the river. And that ancient hedgerow seems to mark the line of that hollow way. The porch fields during summer and spring are full of flowers. They're a mass of yellow right now. And at the bottom of the porch fields, in the lower ground, there's a lovely little area that's often marshy and wet and in winter is a pool. And we can see lots of different plants growing around here. So now I'm going to turn you over to Cynthia, another Trim native, who's going to tell you something about those plants. Hello, my name is Cynthia Simone, and today I'm going to take you on a walking tour with me through the Porchy fields. And we're going to pick out all of the herbs, uh, wild herbs and wild flowers that grow down there. So I must mention, firstly, uh, the elder tree. It's most important that we consider the elder tree because the elder tree is how Trim got its name, Ford of the Elder Tree. They still grow there along the banks of the River Boyne. But be careful with the elder tree. It does house a spirit. And if you take the berries or the flowers without asking for them, oh, you're in for trouble. So we pass down into the next part of the field. And this part during the, particularly during the summer and into the autumn, you will see yarrow. 
yarrow is very very important because yarrow st is a plant known to staunch the flow of blood if you look beside it you'll see the comfrey the comfrey as the monks called it the knit bone it did exactly that it knit bones meadow sweet meadow sweet is a painkiller a natural painkiller so this was used in the making of aspirin now these three herbs are so very important the castle when you look across to it took 30 years to build so imagine all the workmen that were on that site there were carpenters and masons and the injuries that they may have received and it's said and we're told that they brought a little pouch with them tied around their belt and it contained yarrow comfrey and meadowsweet so this is our first first aid kit if you'd like to call it that we go down into the porchy fields now and when we entered the porchy fields you must consider at all times that this was an open allotment so this was where a lot of agriculture was going on. Nettles, don't look down your nose at them, they were a very, very good meal once upon a time. It is said again that if one eats three meals of nettles in the month of May, you'll never have an illness for the rest of the year. So try it out. Now along the banks of the river, you'll get this smell. This is our wild mint. Now mint is not a native and mint it is said that the roman generals forbid their soldiers to partake of mint prior to battle in case their increased love making would weaken them in that battle so beware beware if you partake of mint we head down and we go in to the graveyard itself and if you look on the old walls you will find a herb again it's not a native it's wild margarine and it was brought here by the monks who lived in the Victorine Abbey. The monks would have used this in their cooking but it's also very very good as an anti-inflammatory so it was good for aches and pains in the day. Along the walls too you'll see what looks like a yellow grass but smells very sweet. This yellow grass is called ladies bed straw. The ladies used it for their mattresses so that their rooms would be, smell particularly nice but more importantly it was used in the making of cheese ladies bed straw is what we call a rennet so if you stand in the graveyard and you look at the yew trees the yew trees are both christian and celtic the druids would hold their meetings under a grove of yew trees now the yew tree grows very straight up and if you look at its branch, it's very tall. It has two types of wood, a hard wood and a soft wood. And this was the branch of the yew tree was used by the Normans for the making of their longbow, their weapon of choice. We're going to cross the ring road over to the next section of the porch fields. Bear in mind that the ring road is a recent introduction. Back in the day, there was no interruption to the porch fields, but just take a moment to stand and look back and you can see the sheep gate itself, the hollow way, you can see the town wall, what's left of it, and you can see the yellow steeple. And just for a moment, imagine. The sheep gate is twice the height it is now. The town wall's probably four or five times as high. And the yellow steeple has the church and all the buildings that went on with the monastery of St. Mary's. That's the view that would have greeted the medieval visitor to Trim. Impressive, isn't it? So we're going to cross the road and into the next section of the porch fields. Now we can see those ridges and furrows. We're on a slight ridge. The river is to our right and there's a hedgerow running along beside us down towards the river. What's really interesting here is what actually lies hidden beneath those ridges and furrows, which we can see clearly all over the place. Think back to 2018, when we had that remarkable, dry, hot summer. Modern technology suddenly opened up to us a glimpse into the past, because aerial photography, satellite imagery, revealed what we call crop marks. What are crop marks? If you dig a hole in the ground, or a ditch, or some feature like that, that's going to be deeper than the surrounding earth. 
And when the ground is really, really dry, the earth in that deeper place will stay more moist and the plants that are growing over it will have better access to water so they will be greener and lusher than the surrounding vegetation. And that's precisely what happened during that summer. So monuments were discovered all over the place and the porch fields was no exception. Where we're standing now, close to the road, to our right, there are two monuments, one close to us and one further down towards the riverbank, that are circular features. And these have actually been registered by national monuments as possible monuments. What form might they have been? The likeliest is a burial monument known perhaps as a ring barrow, where you'd have a simple circular ditch with the soil thrown into the centre forming a low mound and the cremated remains of the dead of the community would have been buried there. Along the hedgerow itself, there's another circular feature, perhaps with even an outer circular, maybe two to three ditches, that we can see interrupted by the hedgerow. But there are other possible circular features along the ridge in front of us as we look east towards Newtown Trim. And it would not be uncommon to have a series of these ring barrows or barrow monuments along a ridge of this sort. Equally, they could be the remains of homesteads of people who lived here long ago. After all, we know that across, just across the river, bones from pigs were discovered about 15 years ago in excavations, and they dated to the Iron Age. They had been butchered parts of feasts. So we know that people from the Iron Age, about 2,200 years ago, lived in this area. So they might well have lived or buried their dead across the river here on this lovely south-facing ridge overlooking the River Boyne. We're on our way into Newtown Trim and whether you've taken the lower path by the river or the higher path which would be the old hollow way, you're going to come alongside or through a very defined bank with a shallow ditch and this bank is running north-south from the river up towards the boundary of the house that is extending into the porch fields from the Lackanash Road. This bank is actually part of the boundary defining the borough, that is small, the town of Newtown Trim. And this feature would have completely enclosed the area of Newtown Trim, an area probably of about 23 hectares, which might in fact have been on both sides of the, sides of the river. The townland name Newtown tells the story as it was. It was a new town set up in about 1202 by Simon de Rochford, who was then Bishop of Meath. His own place in Clonard in Meath was under attack from the Irish, so he moved himself and his cathedral here to Newtown Trim. And he built this great church, which he used as a cathedral, and brought in Augustinian canons who were actually priests to serve the church. The church itself was much larger than it is now. The west wall which is in front of you was in fact much closer by about 80 feet, coming out to where the Tarmacadam path is. If you've come up from the river path, there is a sign there which you should stop and read. Take a detour into the cathedral and stop and look east where the altar was and the remains of the windows are and then turn around and look west and picture that wall pushed out another 80 feet and think about the size of the church. We'll go back outside and we can see the remains of where those Augustinian canons lived. They had a chapter house along the east side. This is the remains of the doorway and you can see the platform where the building itself would have been. That would have connected down to another building and turned a corner and we see this two-storey building overlooking the River Boyne and that would have been the dining hall. What a gorgeous view. And then across the way would have been a later kitchen built sometime in the 15th century. So we've got a lot of history right on this spot. Newtown Trim is now better known as a graveyard. But if you go beyond the cathedral, you've got the parish church with the tomb of the jealous man and woman, the effigial tomb of Lucas Dillon and his wife, who lie in state on the, the, the tomb itself, captured in stone, but with a sword lying between them. 
It said, in fact, that if you take a pin and rub it on a wart and leave the pin down by the sword, that as the pin rusts, your wart will disappear. Probably worth trying out, eh? As we walk past the parish church, past the graves of so many who've been buried here in Trim, we come around towards the little stream that flows from Lachan Ash Bridge, which rises at the north side of Trim itself and is known locally as Unclochin Bjog because it's a stony little stream and would have given pure clean water which would have been readily accessible by the people who once lived in this area. I said earlier that New Tantrum was enclosed by a boundary. If we look at the maps now we'll get a picture of what it might have looked like. There is a bridge in Newtown Trim today. North of the bridge, just beyond Marcy's pub, was where the marketplace would have been. And the road continues up to the Navan Road. The gate into the town would have been somewhere on that road. But if you travel up that road and into the left, that's actually where the original road from Trim would have been. Look at the map. Here is a map made by William Larkin in the early 1800s and we can see the road going from Trim over the Lachan Ash Bridge and suddenly it turns northeast, goes up to that road from the Navan Road to the bridge at Newtown and joins it there. Look at the 1832 map, the first edition. That road is no longer there. We have a field boundary and the road from Trim carries straight on meeting the bit of road that we could see on Larkin's map. And look at today's images. That field line is still preserved in the layout of the houses. So the ground beneath our feet doesn't lie. It's telling us that the borough of Newtown Trim extended up to that road, probably right behind Marcy's, down to the river and maybe across the river excluding St John's Priory and taking in some land the other side of the river. This is what the borough would have looked like and people would have had their houses along that internal road and probably farmed the land down by the river which would have been very rich to have your garden plots and there was probably quite an array of houses in that area. Streets pattern, the marketplace beside where Marcy's is, and more houses and lands behind Marcy's. So once upon a time, for a brief time, there was a thriving community here. But sadly, in about the 1600s, it seems to have failed completely and was abandoned and left simply as an amazing relic of an earlier era. I hope you've enjoyed this walk with me. The past is there beneath our feet. If we have eyes to see it and curiosity to explore it, we can find the hidden history of these places.